Hello makers, welcome to 3D Maker Noob. I'm Joe and today I want to show you how to calibrate the 3D printed Rubik's Cube solving robot. Stick around. Welcome back makers. So a few uh, days ago I uploaded the video on uh, this awesome creation right here, which is a 3D printed Rubik's Cube solving robot. Now in that video, I said, if I have enough requests on uh, posting a video on how to calibrate it, I will do so because it is quite a pain to calibrate. Now I've had about two or three people actually saying that they would like me to upload this video. And that means that at least two or three people are willing to put this together and therefore might require some help. So me putting this video up would at least help at least one person and that would make the work all worth it. So without further ado, I'm going to jump on the PC and I'm going to show you guys the whole process. So the first thing to do is obviously plug in the power, plug in the USB for the camera and also power in the USB for uh, the Maestro control center. You will then need to go on the Pololu site and download the uh, drivers and software for the control board. Once you've downloaded the file, all you need to do is extract it to the desktop or anywhere you wish and run the setup file. As soon as it loads up, where it says connected to, make sure you choose the board, go into serial settings and make sure that USB dual port is triggered. Go back to status. Now, when we installed the Pololu, if you follow the instructions on Lodvinta, we used the servo 0, 1, 2, and 3, then 6, 7, 8, and 9. So what we're going to do is we're going to start switching them on one by one. And as you can see, the motors actually triggered. So now they're switched on and all eight servos are active. Once you start moving, this bar here, you can see that the servos respond. So the first thing you need to do is calibrate the servo. You need to find certain positions on the servo. So we're going to need to write down some numbers. So I've prepared an Excel here, which has the servo numbers we will use and the positions for each servo. The first thing we need to do is find the position where the arms are farthest away from the center. And that would be the far position right over here. So what we're going to do is enable the servos one, three, seven, and nine. If they're in upward position, just simply pull the slider onto the left and they go further in until they're flush with the frame. Once you found the position, we're going to take account of those numbers in the far position. So the next thing we need to do is find the zero degree position, which is the idle position. And that is having the grippers in the position which they would grab the Rubik's cube in. So we're going to switch on servos zero, two, six, and eight. And we're going to move the sliders until we find the right position, which is at the zero degree idle angle. Once you have found that position, simply grab the target numbers and put them in the corresponding boxes. Next up is to find the 90 degree angle, meaning that the gripper arms will be parallel to the frame itself. Now, the one important thing to remember here is the fact that each of these movements, whenever it turns from zero degrees to 90 degrees, this has to happen in an anti-clockwise direction. So let's take servo zero. If I move the slider to the right, it does almost a 90 degree angle anti-clockwise. Now, the reason why it almost did a 90 degree and not a full 90 degree is because we have limitations on the target that it can move. Now, in order to increase those targets, we can go to channel settings and increase the maximum number to 3000 for all servos. Once done, click on apply settings, go back to status and switch the servos back on. Now, as you can see, it's still at target 2000 where I left it off, but I still have half of the slider to move further. And if I do that, it turns even more, but 90 degrees is all we need. So now we're going to go ahead and move the sliders to the 90 degree angle so we can take down the numbers. 
Once you have those perfectly at 90 degrees, write down the numbers. Once you've taken down the numbers, we're going to reset the servo arms back to their zero degree position. And what we're going to do next is insert the Rubik's cube and align it with the gripper at the bottom. What we need to do now is determine the position of the servo arms to the near part. And the near would be where the arms would grip the Rubik's cube most effectively. So to determine the near position of the sliders, we can switch off the rotating arms and instead switch on the servo sliders. Now we can start off with the servo nine, which pushes the Rubik's cube upwards. And what we need to do is simply push it high enough upwards so that the center strip of the Rubik's cube align with the grippers. We're then going to take servo three so we can lower the arm at the top. And then very slowly, we're going to grab servo one and servo seven. Now, as you can see, the arms are slightly too high. So what we're going to do is grab servo three and just release it a little bit and push servo nine slightly upwards. Then we're going to grab servo three again, push it slightly down just so it has a good grip on the Rubik's cube. And that looks pretty much okay. So what we're going to do is once again, take note of the near numbers. The last thing I highly suggest you do, it's not something I found online. It's something I was experimenting with. And the reason why I did this was because I had the arms slightly out of sync with the default acceleration. So what I did was I changed the acceleration to 110 on servo 0, 2, 6, and 8. These are the servos which turn the Rubik's Cube. And you need those to be aligned perfectly because if they're slightly out of sync, it will simply get all tangled up and will end up breaking the robot. Once that's done, click on Apply Settings, and we're going to minimize. You are then going to download the Rubik's Cube robot software from the Adventa site. You're going to install the certificates as per the instructions, and you will open the app. Once you install the Rubik's Cube robot software, you will be asked for a registration key. Now, you can get this free of charge from Adventa for 30 days, after which you have to purchase the key. Once you load the screen, you will go into calibration. You'll then be presented with the calibration center, which is where you enter all the values we have taken from the Maestro software. You have arm zero, which has servos one and zero, arm three, servos nine and eight, and so on. So what we're going to do is we're gonna enter the values as we took them here. Once that's done, click on save. We're going to go back and we're going to give it a dry run. Dry run being that we're going to do a test without the Rubik's Cube. So it's very important to take the Rubik's Cube out of the robot. Now, in order to do so, simply go back to the Maestro console, Control Center, switch on the sliding arm servo motors, and simply just start moving them back. Take the Rubik's Cube out. You can switch them back off. And we're going to go back to the software and click on run. So it did the first run. And as you can see, it was taking photos. And what it does is it takes two photos of each side of the cube. Now, the machine worked fine, although it gave me an error because it couldn't detect any lines. However, I noticed a few things. One is that the camera was out of focus. And secondly was that the camera was not aligned properly in the center of the cube. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open the Maestro software. I'm going to insert the Rubik's cube back into the machine and I'm going to close it up. Now that it's closed up, I need to adjust the camera. Now you can use any camera recording software to see what the camera is watching, but I tend to use OBS for this. Now, on the top right hand corner, you can see the current view of the camera that's mounted on the robot. Obviously, it's not focused. Now, in order to focus that, all you need to do is simply grab the lens and turn it. 
until it's perfectly focused as it is there. However, the next problem is that it is not aligned. So ideally, the camera would be pointing right at the center. Now, you can adjust the lens slightly like that. So now that the camera is focused, what we're going to do is we're going to do another run of the robot. So one of the issues that you may have is this error right here, which means that you have possibly too much running in the background. In my case, I have OBS, I have all sorts of slicers, so I'm going to switch those off and try again. Now I managed to do a run on the software. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't record it because for some reason it cannot handle OBS and also this at the same time. Um, so yeah, this was the result. Now, as you can see here, there is an error, error, no lines found. And from the photos that it took, it only seemed to recognize one of them. So we need to analyze exactly what went, on, what went on. Now, when you go into the configuration menu here, you can see enable debugging. Once you enable that, click on save and go back and do another run. Now, what will happen is it will record everything that went on and you can use that data to find out what exactly happened. Okay, so I ran this again with the debugging mode on. As you can see, we still have no lies found and all these black square means that it didn't detect anything. So what we're going to do now is grab the file, grab the photos and data from the debugging mode and upload it onto Odvinta's site. Now this is the site right here and what you need to do is choose the files. Now if I do analysis, it tells me that this is analysis batch 222. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open my Windows Explorer, go to drive D, I'm going to go to user, pictures, and as you can see all the files that I have done so far are here. Now this was run 222. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose the files, which are the photos that it took and the TXT file. I'm going to click open, chose 13 files and upload the files. So once it's done uploading, it will ask you to download the PDF file. So you're going to download it and you're going to have a quick look. And this will be very helpful in calibrating the cube itself. So first off, what you can see is that the image is relatively dark and this is something to always take into consideration. Now currently I have lights pointing towards the Rubik's Cube which means they're contrasting with the uh, with the camera. So it's very important not to have lights directly at it but instead having them behind it. Having said that this is what the camera sees and this is what the software recognizes. And as you can see, it doesn't recognize anything here. But if you scroll full further down, you can see that the white cubes have been recognized quite perfectly fine. The blue haven't at all. Yellow have also been recognized. And the orange have been recognized. Now, as you can see here, it shows you hue and saturation. And this will be used in a bit. But first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to redo a calibration run. However, this time I'm going to turn it around so the lights face the back of, uh, of the robot. So I did another run and this time I also slightly tilted the camera in order for the lines to be perfectly horizontal. So once again, I'm going to upload the debugging files and see exactly what the camera saw. Now, while that is uploading, you can already see that it recognized the green, the blue, the orange, the yellow, and the red, but it did not recognize the white. And this report will actually help us calibrate the saturation and the hue so the camera can recognize the colors that it should be looking at. And this is the final report. Now, as you can see, it looks perfectly clear. Lines are horizontal. There were no errors and it recognized everything. And the only issue we've had in this report is the fact that it didn't recognize the white. As you can see here, out of the uh, nine cubes, it only recognized the center one as white. And the reason for that is because it 
is not calibrated properly to recognize the white depending on the ambient light it has. So in order to fix that, we're going to go to configuration where you will have these hues and saturation thresholds here. And for the white, you'll need to look at these three thresholds at the bottom. So white is like blue because we're going to give it a tint. We're going to leave it as blue. And then we have a white saturation threshold and also a white if saturation below. And it's set to zero. Now, what this is telling it is that if the saturation is below zero, then consider it at white. However, the saturation, which is the S here, is not under zero. It's just over zero. So what we need to do there is just correct that. So if we look at white, if saturation is below 0 0.04, we should be fine. Now for the rest, we're going to look at the red which it recognized perfectly fine. However, the hue is slightly off. Now here it says that the red hue is zero. Now while it recognized it, it's always good to calibrate this just to always get the right results. What I tend to do is grab the hues of all nine boxes and sort of get an average. And on here, I can see that the average is about 10. So I'm just going to change that to 10. For the yellow, the same thing. We're just going to grab the hue and we're going to take an average, which is approximately about 54. For the orange, the average hue, I'd say, is about 25, which is perfectly spot on. The blue is around an average of all the hues would be around 223. So we can change that to 223. The green is around 125. So we can change that to 125. And that would be it. Now, if you notice, the saturation doesn't really matter on the colors. It only matters on the white. And that's where it, where it should be taken into account. The rest just considers hue. So once done, click on save. And we're going to give it another go. So the final one is ready. And as you can see here, it actually recognized all the colors perfectly fine and it said ready there was no errors whatsoever so now what's left to do is simply mix it up and let it run now while usually i would say that's basically it i know that it's a bit of a headache it took me a few hours to figure all this out and also for the acceleration of the servos fine tuning to right find the right position it didn't take me that long now because I've done this for quite a while now. So it's very important not to give up, not to stress out. Just make sure you take your time, calibrate the position properly because it's very, very important to get it right. And also keep in mind that there has to be light from the back rather than the front because it interferes with the camera. Also, once you calibrate it, it, ha it will probably only work in that place that you calibrate it in. If you move it around, the light will change in the surrounding area, meaning that the hue and saturation of the color will look different to the camera depending on the ambient light. So that is it for me, guys. And I, I really truly hope that this helps quite a few of you. And it's not just for those who build this model, even for the fact that through this model, I've learned how to apply the Maestro Pololo 12 channel with servos and possibly now I've ordered some Arduino um, Uno is because I want to experiment more. So this once again is a stepping stone for me for bigger and better things on the channel. So once again, I want to thank you guys for watching. I want to also thank Filamentive who sponsored this episode thanks to uh, their awesome RPLA filament. Please make sure you check them out in the video description below. As always, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comment section below. I would be more than happy to reply to them. Thank you very much. And as always, Happy making, guys.